Well, I would just like to warn you that uh, Northwest Arkansas's allergies have uh, grabbed a hold of me and they've kind of got a stranglehold on me. And so I took some medicine this morning and I actually feel like I'm floating a couple inches off the ground, off the floor. So if, if things seem strange this morning, uh, it wasn't the spirit, it was the medicine. Um, uh, before, before we get started, you'll notice when you, when you came in, uh, hopefully you were given some of these, these We Believe cards. And then on the back, you have information about, about the church. So here's, here's the way this works. You can do a couple of things with these cards. These are invite cards. You can go to somebody who's a complete stranger and say, Hey, I want to invite you to my church. And he's going to say, Okay, well, thanks. And, and God might do something with that because we believe uh, that... Uh, the Word of God never returns void, that when we share something, when we give something away, God always uses it. So that's one thing that could happen. Or you could give it to somebody that you do know. You could give it to a, a neighbor, a co-worker, a family member, uh, a friend, and you could just go up to them and you'd say, Hey, Bob, I want, I, my preacher's preaching this new sermon series right now. I would love for you to come and be my guest at, at, at Elmdale Baptist Church. All the information's on the back. Yeah, you're welcome. And you see that? And he even showed up, right? So, so listen, that's what those are for, and that's the reason why we, why we give those out, because, because it's just opportunities to invite people. And you know what? I've, I've told you all this before, but when I invite people to hear me preach, it's a little awkward, a little bit vain even. It's really good, though, when you invite people to church. Uh, th this church isn't going to grow just because I know somebody or because, because Jeff knows somebody or because, uh, because of my preaching or because of Jeff's music. The church is going to grow because you invite people. And so that's, that's what those cards are for, for you to be able to invite, invite people. So, if you've got your Bibles, uh, we're going to be all over the place today. There are some things that we never quite understand. For example... Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? <laughs> or, why do noses run and feet smell? Or how about this, why is it that when bosses talk about improving productivity, they're never talking about themselves? Yeah, I got a couple of people that like that one. Here's another good one. Another thing maybe we never quite understand is why are there flotation devices in the seats of airplanes instead of parachutes? I mean, imagine, flotation devices only help over part of the earth. They don't help over the, well, the land. Then why are they called apartments when they're all stuck together? More importantly, why would we want to study theology? I mean, uh, isn't, isn't theology the kind of thing for, for scholars and theologians? Why would, we want to, why would we want to talk about this? Plus, plus, when you think about theology, I don't know, if you've been in church long enough, you've heard enough Christians uh, gripe and complain and fight about theological issues that you are just like, I don't get it. What's the big deal? See, here's the reason why we study theology, because theology is really just the study of God. It's, it's talking about God, it's knowing what we believe about God, and then it's, and then it's being able to, to just, just understand what you believe about God. And that's why we're doing this series called We Believe, because it's important for you to know what you believe. It's, infor it's important for me to know what I believe. Uh, and th because theology is for everyone, so, some people uh, some people have a theology of well, well, God is love, and God is gonna uh, God is gonna uh, save everybody eventually. Uh, wh whether it's true or not, that's a theology that some people have. 
Some people have a theology, well, that God kind of, uh, God, God kind of got the will started in creation, but then he, just kind of, then he left it all to the side. He left it alone. He said, I'm just not going to deal with it anymore. I'm not going to worry about it anymore and say that God's not really involved uh, in, in his creation. So that, that would be another type of theology that some people have. Some people would even have a theology, well, I'm not even sure I can, I, that anybody can even know if there is a God, which is in, in itself is its own type of theology. Theology. We all have theology, whether it's, whether it's a right theology or a wrong theology. We all have belief about God. We all have a belief about, about the Bible. We all have a belief about, about heaven and about hell. We all have our beliefs on those things. So what, what we want to do is through this series of we, of we Believe, we want to know what it is that we believe. We want to know what the Bible teaches about, about God and about Jesus and about man and about sin and about, and about itself. We want to know what the Bible teaches. So I'm going to ask if you would, I'm going to lead us in just a, in just a word of prayer to focus, to, that God would focus us around on knowing Him. If you would, bow with me, bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to us today. God, if there's any preconceived notions or ideas that we have that, that may be false, God, I pray that you'd reveal those to us. God, today we want to know you more deeply and more intimately. God, so reveal yourself to us. God, and I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we believe in the God of the Bible. Let's just start right there, which is, which is the reason why we started with what we believe about the Bible last week. We believe in the God of the Bible, the, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's called I Am, or He's called Yahweh. He's called Elohim. We believe in the God of the Bible. And that's our, that's our starting point. Uh, and we believe that God has revealed Himself through the Bible. That anything, that anybody... Now, we, we may know some general things about God, that there, like that there is a God by looking at creation, but the specific things that we know about God, we have to learn those from somewhere. I mean, you just don't, the things that we're going to talk about today, you just don't necessarily wake up and realize, oh yeah, well, God is, is all-knowing. You might think that, but, but do you have any reason to believe it other than somebody telling it and showing that to you? So we go to the Bible for that. Well, what is this God of the Bible like is really the question that we want to talk about today. What is this God that we, that we worship every Sunday morning and that we live our lives for hopefully seven days a week? What is this God really, really like? And in our world, in the culture we live in, that's a big deal. Because a lot of people make, like to, to create their God uh, the same way that we like to maybe go, like maybe go into Golden Corral. We like, to, we like to go in and we like to pick out the things about God that we like. But if we don't like, if you go to Golden Corral and you don't want fish, guess what? You don't have to eat fish. If you go to Golden Corral and you don't want chicken, God forbid, <laughs> you don't have to eat for, eat chicken. And most of us have our beliefs about God. We we like to kind of leave certain things about God out. Well, I don't really like that about. About God, so so I'm gonna. I like this about God, so this is gonna be the way my God is. And we like to kind of build a God in our image rather than worshiping God and and and, and worshiping God for for who He is. So we believe in the God of the Bible, and we believe uh, we believe that we can know Him. So that's our first thing. Number one, God is knowable. This is important. God is knowable. Not only is God knowable, God wants you to know Him. He wants you to know Him personally. He wants to be known by you. Because the reality is God already knows everything about you. He wants you and He wants me to know Him in a personal way. We exist to know Him and to make Him known. God is knowable. John 17, 3 says this. These are Jesus' words. He says, this is eternal life. This is a great verse. Listen, this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, 
and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3.10, he says, My goal is to know Him. Or he says, My determined purpose is that I may know God. In other words, eternal life isn't just about going to heaven. It's not just about a, a, a get, out of, get out of hell or something. Eternal life is about having a relationship with God. And it's about knowing Him personally. So God is knowable, but not only is God knowable, God is eternal. God is, He was, and He always will be. Here's the way Psalms chapter 90 verse 2 says. It says, before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth, in the world. In other words, God created, and before God created, from eternity past to eternity future, you are God. That, that's why when, when, he can, when he comes to Moses and Moses says to him, Well, who do I tell the people of Israel? Who do I tell them you are? You said, Who do I tell them sent me? You said, I am sent you. It wasn't, I was sent you. It wasn't, I'm going to be. It's, I am. Because, just, because God always was. He always is. He always will be. From eternity to eternity, God is. God's eternal. It says in Ephesians 1.4, it says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. God had, had chosen, chosen those to follow Him before He even founded and created the world. Listen to what Revelation 1.8 says. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the One who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. God always existed. Well, then the question becomes up, well, well, well who created God? Well, God, th that's just it. God wasn't created. God always was. Well, that's not good enough for me to tell my kids. Well, that's all I got. God is. From eternity to eternity, God is eternal. But not only this, God is omnipresent. In other words, He's, he's present everywhere. Listen to Psalms 139, 7 through 10. Where can I go to escape your spirit? This is David. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make, a bed and make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle on the western, at the western limits, even there, your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. Jeremiah 23 says he fills heaven and earth. In other words, there's nowhere you can go where you're away from God's presence. Nowhere. Which means when you're committing a sin, God is there. When you're, when you're doing something, when you go someplace that you're not supposed to be going, God is there. When you feel like God isn't present, God is there. But Billy, how come I don't feel His presence sometimes? I mean, that just doesn't make sense to us. If God is, is present everywhere, if He's always there, why is it that sometimes we just feel like God's not there? And I don't know that I have a great answer for that. Except that sometimes what it seems like God does is God challenges us to see whether we're going to believe Him or not. To believe Him that He is there. Even when, he, when it feels like He's not there. Because I know if there's one thing we can all agree on is that that is that we've all been at those places where we felt like well, we felt like we were alone. We felt like God had abandoned us. We felt like God, that God was no, no longer hearing our prayers, let alone answering our prayers. But you hear, here's, the, here's the thing we learn as we read the Bible. God often remains silent in the lives of His people. 
Now think about this. In God's silence, the people of Israel ended up for 400 years slaves in Egypt. I mean, I mean, really, he, he went to all this trouble to call Abraham to lead Isaac and Jacob and to, and to take care of them. He takes them to Egypt to save them from a famine in the book of Genesis. Then he, he just leaves them there and they become slaves in Egypt. And, and, and God was silent. There's, there's, even a, there's even a place where, uh, in the, at the beginning of 1 first, first Samuel, where it says the word of God was rare. In other words, it's like people were trying to hear from God, but God wasn't speaking. You think about David. I mean, it was, it was David who had been obedient to God, who had been faithful to God, and yet he still found himself running away from King Saul. Joseph is, is probably one of the greatest examples in, in the whole Bible because, because Joseph had been obedient to God and yet he still ended up a slave. Joseph stayed obedient to God while he was a slave and he ended up in prison. And where's God in all of that? Not only that, what about Jesus? I mean... I mean, Jesus, Jesus had never even sinned. He never turned his back on God. And yet he, cry, he cries out from the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, the answer is yes. God doesn't always make his presence. We don't always feel God's presence in our life. But God is always present, whether we feel it or not. We have to remember what I think a lot of these people in the Bible had to remember. Listen to what Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is great and God is powerful and we live in a sinful world in which we often wonder why God feels so distant or why God stays so silent. But you see, we believe that God is near even at the moment when we feel most distant from Him. Romans 8.28 says this, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are called according to His purpose. In other words, time and again, God orchestrates events so that they work out for His glory. He orchestrates our sicknesses. He even orchestrates our sins to work out, to draw attention to himself and to help us grow and to help us become stronger. God orchestrates all of this stuff, but what he says there, he says, we know that all things work together for, for the good of those who do what? Love God. Do you love God? No, no, no. Do, do you really love God? That promise applies to you if you love God. Philippians 1.6, the Apostle Paul says this. And by the way, when the, when the Apostle Paul wrote what he wrote here in Philippians, he was in prison. And he wasn't in prison for killing somebody or for robbing, robbing somebody. He was in prison because he remained faithful to God and he obeyed God. And listen to what he says. He says, I am sure of this. That he who started a good work in, in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And he believed that God was not, had not given up on him. He believed that just because he was in prison didn't mean God wasn't present. It didn't mean that God had said, you know what, you, I, I've done all I can with you. 
He knew that God was with him. God is with you. Cry out to him. And when you cry out to him and you don't hear you don't hear some kind of voice immediately, it doesn't mean that God's not with you. You keep crying out to him. You keep going to him. And then you find out what then you begin to see what God's doing to orchestrate answering your prayers in his life. What people has he put in your life? What what ways has he already provided for that need that you're worried about? What things has he already been doing that you've just, not, you've just not noticed because you've been so focused on me, me, me? What is it that God's been doing in your life? So God is knowable, God is eternal, and God is present everywhere. Well, how can God be present everywhere at once? Because here it is, God is spirit. That's the next thing. God is a spirit. John 4, 24, Jesus says God is spirit. In other words, he doesn't, have, he doesn't have eyes and ears like you and I have. He doesn't have a, a physical body like you and I have. God is spirit. And God is invisible. John 1.18. Nobody is, John 1.18 says nobody's ever seen God. Except for the few times where God chose to make himself visible by revealing himself to, in some physical manner. God is all-knowing, 1 John 3.20 and Hebrews 4.13. God is all-powerful, Genesis 18.14 says, Is there anything that's too, too hard for the Lord? John, Jeremiah 32.17 says, Nothing is too hard for you. Matthew 19.26 says, With God all things are possible. So God is all-powerful. Not only is God all-powerful, God is also good. And God is also loving. John 4, 8 says that God is love. Now listen, that God is good and God is loving are two of the parts that when we go to the, to the buffet of religions, we like to pick up those parts of God. Those are the things that we like to talk about. In fact, even when we witness to people, we like to talk about how God has this great plan of your, in your, for your life, and He does. And that God is good and that God, God loves you. And both of those things are true. But if that's the extent of your belief about God, then, then you're going to be in for a rude awakening one day. Because yes, God is good and God is also loving. But God is also holy. And God's holiness re re requires Him to act in a certain way. Psalms 99, 9, Isaiah 3, both, both tell us that God is holy. And what that means is, is that he is, He's separated from sin. He's different. He's set apart from the rest of the world. He's God. Evil and sin are beyond His capacity to commit. It's, it's beyond His ability. Is there anything God can't do? Yes, God cannot sin. Because God is holy. And because God is righteous, and because God is holy, listen, He requires us to be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, The Lord our God is holy, therefore you're to be holy. Well, what does that really mean for us? Well, what that means is, is that because God is holy and we're to be holy, we're not going to be doing the same things everybody else in this world does. We don't act the same way that everybody else in this world acts. I mean, I mean what it really means is, is that when, when some people skip church, we're still going to church. When pe some people are spending their money in certain ways on, on, on things that, that, that maybe aren't a sin or anything, but they're just not the ways that maybe God would have you since spend your money. The people that, that the world would hang around with, the way the world would spend their time, God, God would say, no, no, that's not the way you do it. That's not you. You see, God is holy, and because God is holy, He calls us to be holy. He calls us to be different. To be set apart in the way we live and the way we act. But God, God, God is holy. Not only though is God holy, but God is also righteous and just. 
Deuteronomy 32, 4, and Isaiah 45, 19. Now this is really one of, the, one of the main parts that we like to leave out about God. Because we like to talk about God and His forgiveness. I mean, we like to be able to say, you know, well, I, you know, I think God is going to forgive everybody because He's a loving God. But God can't stop being righteous and just just so He can be loving. And just so He can forgive. This is where we got to get the full picture of who God is. So how, is God, how does God handle this? I mean, how is, it that, how is it that God remains righteous and just the way a good judge is supposed to? Uh, so, so let's just think about this for just a moment. If, there, if there's somebody who, who's pulled over for going 75 miles per hour in a school zone, they pulled over. They didn't, they didn't run into any kids. They didn't hurt anybody. But a policeman caught them, and they were pulled over. The policeman pulls them over, and because he's going so fast, and because of, because of how bad that, that particular broken law is, he takes him, he takes him to the, takes him to jail for it. Now, if that judge, as he's before that judge, if that judge says, you know what, you didn't hurt anybody, it was probably your first time anyways, right? I mean, you never drive 75 in a school zone, right? Now, you didn't hurt anybody, so you know what? I'll just, I'll forgive you this time. Now, let me ask you this. If you knew that a judge let somebody go free that was going 75 miles per hour in a school zone without making them pay some type of price, would you be happy about that? Of course you wouldn't. Because not only is he endangering his own life, he's endangering, more importantly, the lives of all these children. And in the same way, it's because he's a good judge. And in the same way, because God is a good, a righteous judge, he can't just look over sins. He can't just say, oh, you know what, that was, that, that's not you. I know you didn't mean to. Oh, you're not really hurting anybody. Which is really one of the, 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 the strange things about, about sin is all of our sin always hurts more people than just ourselves. Ah, you're okay. It's all over with. I'll just forgive you of that one day. God can't do that because God is righteous. So how does God, how do, how does God handle this thing about being righteous and being, and being loving all at the same time? That's where Jesus comes in. Listen to this. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrates his own what? Love for us in this. While we were still sinners, sinners, that means deserving of punishment, deserving of God's righteous uh, judgment. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God is love and God is righteous and He remained true to His nature, to who he, who he is by punishing our sin, by making Jesus receive it for us. Actually, He didn't even make Jesus. What, what it says when Jesus came to earth, it says in John, I think chapter 10, it says, J Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. He said, but I lay my life down. Why? Because Jesus was going to be love and he was going to be righteous all at once. Because of God's righteousness, you and I deserve to be punished. Now, I know you think because I'm a preacher that I don't commit too many sins. But I do. And even if I stopped right now for the rest of my life committing sins, somebody still has to pay for the sins that I've committed for my life, my, my last 37 years. And I'm the one that should do that. But because of God's love, He sent Jesus. So that Jesus died for your sins and He died for my sins. But you don't automatically get it. 
Not everybody automatically inherits eternal life. And I'll tell you why. Let me just read this to you. This is John chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 16. For God so did what? Yeah, loved. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. In other words, that you won't die and spend an eternity paying for your sins, but that you can have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world that He might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Then in verse 18, He says, Anyone who believes in Him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So in order for Christ's death on the cross to be placed to your credit, you have to be willing to lean fully into him. In other words, to place your faith in Him 100%. How do I do that? You do that by, by just being bare, broken before God. By saying, God, you know what? I'm a sinner. Man, I, I'm the worst of sinners. I mean, the reality for every single one of us in here, there are sins that we've committed in our lives that, that every single one of us would blush if the person next to us knew about them. And we admit to God. We quit trying to cover it up. We tr quit trying to handle it ourselves. But we cry out to God and we say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need, I, I want to accept your gift and your salvation into my life so that I don't have to pay for my own sins. But now here's the thing. Remember that verse we read at the beginning where it says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true living God? God's goal isn't, isn't just to get you into heaven. God's goal is to begin to change you here. He wants you to know Him here. Listen, God loves you the way you are. But He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. I mean, this whole thing, you know, we set up this thing as well, that we can't really do what's in the Bible. But here's the thing. We, we can fulfill what God has called us and told us to do in the Bible. You know why? And we'll get to this later. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of us is one who works in us and who helps us to live and to act in a way that draws, draws glory and draws attention to God. But you see, God, God loves us, but He doesn't want to leave us the way we are. So then the challenge for you is for you to cry out to God. For you to call to God and say, God, I need you. But then why? Why do we believe in God? I mean, uh, I mean, we've not seen Him. If He's a spirit, then you can't see Him. If you can't see Him, you don't know He's there. Why, why do we believe in God? Couldn't it just be that this is just, a, again, another religious book that we've all, that we've all just kind of bought into? Because after all, Billy, you were raised in a Baptist church. You were raised reading the Bible. Surely, maybe you're wrong. Why do we believe in God? I got a couple of directions that I'd go to try to answer that question, but the first one is this. I want you to think with me. Pretend I'm walking through Devil's Den State Park. I'm, I'm taking a hike. And on that hike, after a couple hours of hiking, I come, I come to this, this cabin in the middle in the middle of the forest. And as I'm walking by, I get a whiff of something. That smells like Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so what do I do? I walk up to that cabin to try and to, to investigate a little bit more. 
And it gets stronger the closer I get. And I walk in, I knock on the door, nobody opens, but, but, but the door just kind of opens and I look in. There's a Chick-fil-A sandwich and waffle fries, nice and hot, sitting on that table. Along with a bottle of water, because that's what I eat, what I drink. So I sit down and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the Chick-fil-A sandwich. I'm enjoying my fries. I got my five packs of ketchup right there because I eat lots of ketchup. And then I look over and there's a TV and I turn on the TV and, and guess what? They're, the Bulldogs, the Georgia Bulldogs are playing football. Ah. Oh. And it just happens to be a replay from October 18th when the Bulldogs beat the Arkansas Razorbacks. <laughs> Had to bring it up. <laughs> and so I, so I sit down and watch the, watch the game. I think, well, I just got done eating, and I'm, my, my, I just went to the dentist. My teeth are having some issues. Prayers appreciated. So I, I, I go to the, the bathroom because I need to brush my teeth, and my favorite toothpaste is there. Nice little electric toothbrush is there, power toothbrush. Then I go look in the bedroom and there's a picture of my wife and my two kids right there. And everything, it's like everything is perfect. Now, now when I leave there, do you think I'm thinking, oh man, that was a coincidence? Am I thinking that's a coincidence? No, I'm thinking, I think somebody prepared that place just for me. And when we look at this world that we live in, this world has been prepared and designed just for us. There's, there's so many parameters to where, where if things were moved just a little bit, if things were changed just a little bit, then, then, then the life that you and I live on this earth would no longer be possible for us to live. See, the reality is the reason we believe in God has more to do than just with, with believing because we've seen the Bible. It has to believe because it takes more faith not to believe in God than it takes to believe in Him. It takes more blind faith to, to, to say that that can't be true and that can't be true and that can't be true than for us to say, you know what, this is, this is the real deal. But listen to what he says in Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Yes, we believe in God. And our prayer today is to be assured about that belief in God. Our prayer today is, is to not let just what this, this world that we live in would try to say and to, to try and cause us to, to disbelieve. Because we said this last week, the devil is doing everything he can to cause us to question God's love, to question whether God even cares, or even to question whether God even exists. But we need to stand upon the evidence that's there, and we need to stand upon the Word of God. And the challenge today is for you, first of all, Christians, to become strong in your belief in God. And when I say that, you, I also mean, don't just, don't just believe. And students, kids, this is for you. Don't just believe, well, my mom and dad said, it, said he's real, so I'm going to believe it. That'll last you until you get in about midway through high school. If, that's all, if you, all you've got to go is on what, I, what your mom and your dad have said, you don't have enough. We need to get in the Word. We need to experience God for ourselves and our own personal lives. We need to hear Him speak. And then we need to examine the evidence that's out there. But Christians, you need to know. 
because you're going to have opportunities to have conversations because you know what? When people ask why you believe in God, that's a legitimate question. And every single one of us have the opportunity to answer that question and talk about it if we'll take the time to figure out why we believe what we believe. I'm going to ask if you would to bow with me. We're going to pray.